So today we have a quite nice schedule of speakers. We start with four speakers for question one, and then later we have two tutorials by Alan Spuduguzic and Sofia Economo. In this first session, we have two speakers, Tim Taminiao from QTech in Delft, and then Kim Jong Yoon from Korea, and their talks will be quite related. So it, it is really my great pleasure to introduce you Tim Taminiao from QTech in Delft. He did his PhD at ICFU in Spain, and then he moved to Delft, uh, where after a postdoc with Ronald Hanso, he started his own group. And he's doing fantastic work on sensory nuclear spins in Diamond. So we, we've already heard something about this on Monday from Christian Dakin's talk. Tim is going to give us um, a different perspective about uh, a similar topic. So welcome, Tim, and the floor is yours. OK, yes. Thank you, Christian. Uh, it's good to see such a, a big audience. I hope you're all doing well in this challenging times with this coronavirus. So my talk uh, today um, will focus on, on sensing, imaging, and controlling individual spins. And the main player here is going to be uh, the so-called nitrogen vacancy or NV center in Diamond. This consists of an, uh, a vacancy next to uh, and a nitrogen atom in the carbon lattice. And what is really important here is that this defect has two uh, key properties. So first we have a spin, an electronic spin, that has good coherence and that we can control. And that, that really uh, supplies us with a quantum bit or a qubit. And then second, this spin is optically active. So it interacts with light. And that allows us, for example, to detect initialize and measure this individual spin. Now, I want to immediately mention that there's a whole zoo of, uh, of related systems, uh, for example, other defects uh, in, in diamond, and also in other materials uh, like silicon carbide. And there's a lot of great work going on around the world uh, to control such defects. And many of the ideas that you will see here also apply to, uh, to these other systems. Quickly. Fix one technical issue. There we go. Okay. Um, and the other thing that you see in this image is that this NV center is not alone. Also drew in here some uh, nuclear spins. These are these yellow, uh, these yellow spins. So these are carbon 13 nuclear spins. And they naturally make up about 1% of the diamond. And in this talk, those are the spins that we're going to be sensing, imaging, and, and, and controlling. Okay, so why is this such an interesting system? Okay. So really, this gives us a very versatile platform for quantum science and technology. And on the one hand, these MV centers or defects in uh, optically active defects are a candidate to build quantum networks where we have nodes that contain, contain multiple of these spins uh, that are qubits to store and process quantum states. And then can have optical links to connect them together into a network. And this provides a path towards modular quantum computation and as well as uh, long range quantum cryptography. And then additionally, because these, these spin qubits have such a good coherence, they also become very good sensors. An example here. And as these are solid state systems, with good coherence that exists at a very large range of temperatures, including uh, room temperature. And they are sensitive to all sorts of quantities like electric fields, magnetic fields, uh, but also pressure and, and, and temperature. Um, these are very uh, interesting sensors. And again, there's a lot of uh, work out there, lots of great ideas. An example that I put here on the slide is the idea of bringing uh, one of these defect spins close to the surface of, uh, in this case, a diamond and then placing interesting complex systems like uh, perhaps individual molecules on top and being able to image these uh, magnetically using the, the defect as a center. And finally, this kind of controlled complex coupled spin systems, they also provide a natural platform to study many body physics and to perform quantum simulations. Now in this talk, I won't go into uh, in, in all, all these things. I'll quickly flash some progress, for example, in these optical links for, for quantum networks. 
but then focused mostly on the challenge of, of sensing, uh, imaging, and controlling individual spins in the environment of the defect. And I will argue that all these uh, challenges that we encounter there are actually also promising avenues for testing and also applying machine learning methods for quantum. I won't go into any uh, actual machine learning results or methods, um, but for that I want to point you towards uh, what I think is the next talk um, where uh, Kyung Hoon will uh, show how we use machine learning methods to analyze some of the data sets that I'll be showing in this talk uh, with great success. Okay, brief outline of the, of the rest of the presentation. I want to start with a, an introduction of the uh, NV Center. And in particular, uh, uh, try to show why this is an interesting system to study and to think about applying machine learning methods to. And second, I'll discuss how we can use the NV Center to sense and control individual nuclear spins in its environment. And show that we can, uh, in that way, really build little quantum processors where we can control uh, at the moment about 10 spins, qubits. And then finally, I want to move to the question how can we use the spin not only to detect, uh, how, how can we use this defect not only to detect spins in the environment, but also to, to, to image them, to create spatial images. And in particular, in the case where you have complex structures, where you have many spins that are all in, also interacting. Okay, just to set the stage, I want to start with what do the actual devices look like? So I mentioned we're going to focus on this nitrogen vacancy center. Vacancy, missing carbon atom next to a nitrogen atom in the carbon letters of diamond. Some electrons are captured here at this vacancy. And essentially that gives us a spin that we're going to use as our qubit. Now all the results that I'll be showing are taken in a cryostat at a temperature of four Kelvin. If you look what's inside there, uh, you find these kind of samples. So this little square here is a diamond sample, a few millimeters large. It's wired up on our, on our uh, on a chip. If we then zoom in with an electron microscope, we see images like this. So the gray stuff here is the diamond. And we fabricate or sculpture out this half sphere or solid immersion lens out of the diamond using a focused ion beam. And that is just to be able to collect efficiently the light coming from the from the defect. And in detail, you can see if you just scan a laser over your, over that sample, when you're in the middle of this half sphere, you see a bright spot. That is the NV center being uh, excited by a laser and fluorescing, uh, and we can detect uh, that's fluorescent. We then also create structures like this. Here's a microwave line, um, for example, where we send through microwave pulses, and those are to control the spin state or the qubit itself. So here you see an example of a so-called Rabi oscillation where we prepare the spin in, in spin up uh, and then apply a microwave pulse of various lengths. And then you can see the spin coherently rotating from up to down and up again. Yeah? So that's just to show that this is a good controlled quantum bit. Now, the other important ingredient that we need is, is how do we actually detect what the spin state is? And for that, we also use optics. Um, it's a little bit different than you might have seen in other talks with, with NV centers, because we work at uh, typically at 4 Kelvin, and there we can use resonant optical excitation. What does that mean? We can take a laser and we can scan it in frequency. And you see here then an excitation spectrum. So for certain frequencies, we excite the NV center and we see, uh, an, uh, and we see fluorescence. And these different uh, transitions, they belong to different spin states. And that means that we can read out the system in a quite simple way. We just apply a laser that is only resonant with one of the spin states, for example here given the MS is zero spin state. Then only when we're in that state, we excite the system, we create, uh, we, uh, and create light and, and therefore detect photons. Whereas if we're in, in any of the other states, it stays dark. And you can see that here, we prepare uh, the, the bright state, which I called here spin up. We detect on average about 8.5 photons. Whereas if we prepare uh, the other spin state, it stays dark and we detect nearly zero photons. So that gives us a good, very high contrast readout mechanism of, of this uh, quantum bit. 
Okay, what about the properties of, of, of this spin? Uh, I want to highlight a few that I, I think are important to make the point of why this is such an interesting system. So first, this is a measurement of the electron spin relaxation time, which was what we call T1. It's a very simple experiment. You take the spin, you put it in spin up, and then you just see how long it stays there. Essentially, if it relaxes due to any interactions with the environment. What you can see here is that if we prepare the, um, the spin in any of its states and we wait, it stays uh, where it starts. And then only after a long time, in this case about 10 minutes, you start seeing some decay from which you can uh, fit a relaxation time of about one hour. It is a very boring experiment, right? You prepare the spin, you go for a coffee, you come back, it's still there in the same way. And that's actually really good news. It means that this kind of relaxation processes do not limit the, the coherence of the system and also does not limit to what detail we can study it. It means it's a very clean system. There's no kind of dissipative interactions that are difficult to control, like spontaneous emission or, or interactions with, with phonons, vibrations in the, um, in, in the diamond. And that means really that the physics or the system here is on the one hand really simple. It's just spins interacting with each other. And, uh, and, and that means that we can hope to understand uh, and control it actually in, in great detail. But at the same time, it's a highly complex system because as we'll see, there are many spins involved so that all are interacting. Now, a nice example uh, of that is to look at the coherence of the, of the NV center electron spin. So if we um, just take this electron spin and we put it in a, in a superposition, and we see how long does it uh, uh, take to deface, to decohere. It's only a few microseconds. That's what we call T2 star, about five microseconds. And that's because there's a lot of these nuclear spins in the environment, and they all continuously change their states, then they're random. This creates a kind of random magnetic field on the electron spin, uh, which means that it picks up a random phase and, and loses its quantum state. And what can we now do? Um, we can actually protect the electron spin from its environment by periodically inverting it with a decoupling sequence. Essentially, by inverting the spin, you invert the interaction. And as long as the uh, environment fluctuates slowly, inverting the interaction allows you to cancel it. And it works really well. So here you can see an example of where we prepare uh, a quantum superposition of the electron spin. And up here, the spin is preserved, coherence is preserved. Down here, it's lost. And you can see as we apply more and more of these inversion, uh, inversion pulses here from uh, about four up to, up to all the way to about 10,000, the coherence uh, is preserved, preserved longer and longer. And in this case, up to about 1.5 seconds. We can really isolate the system from that very complex environment in this way. Now, similarly, you can also look at the coherence of these nuclear spins, in this case, uh, show here a result for the nitrogen-14 uh, nuclear spin that is intrinsic to the to the NV center defect. And because the nuclear spins have uh, even a, a smaller magnetic moment than the electron spin, uh, the coherence times can be even much longer. And here you see, for example, that if we apply, uh, in this case, 256 of these inversion pulses, we can already store quantum states in such a nuclear spin for about um, over a minute. Now that both makes these systems excellent quantum bits for quantum networks, for quantum information. But it also means that we can really turn these interactions in this complex system off. And if we then can find also ways to selectively turn them on again, we can do very uh, precise sensing and control of these spins in this, uh, in this system. Okay, I want to quickly say something about these optical entanglement links, which are uh, crucial if, if you want to use these systems to build quantum networks, which is one of the big motivations uh, here at, uh, at QTech, where my group is. Um, so these optical entanglement links uh, already work um, uh, sin since a while. So here you see an example from an experiment from 2015, where we created an entanglement between one NV center and a diamond here in the physics building. That's where I'm sitting right now with another diamond uh, about 1.3 kilometers away on the other side of the campus. And the idea was the, uh, that, uh, that we used this uh, for, to perform a so-called loop of free bell test, uh, but that's not important here. 
And then there's also been recent beautiful follow-up experiments by uh, the group of Ronald Hanson, where they have shown that you can use start using these kind of optical links to do uh, to distribute entangled pairs between different chips, between different diamonds, uh, and also uh, use distillation to make that process better. Additionally, they also then recently showed that you can connect three of these chips together. And uh, uh, the message here really is that these optical links are also in parallel developing very rapidly and are starting to get to the point that we can start thinking about building larger quantum networks. Here I want to uh, focus on, on controlling actually the, the spins and the qubits inside these nodes. And, and that's what we'll move on to now. So as I mentioned, uh, the kind of key idea here is that this NV center is not alone. It's surrounded by this entire bath of nuclear spins that make up about 1% of the diamond. And I've shown you that by <clears throat> Just periodically inverting the electron spin, we can decouple it from that environment. But that doesn't allow us to sense it, right? That just protects it from the environment. So how can we now sense and then ultimately also image and control that environment? I'll go give you first a classical picture of how this, uh, how this works. So here you, you again see a sequence of pulses where these, uh, these pi pulses here, these four, they invert the electron spin. And if my uh, environment is, is static, so it looks like a static magnetic field, if I invert the spin, I actually cancel the interaction and I, I decouple it. But what now if my environment creates oscillating signals that have precisely a frequency that matches this inversion? Now I essentially rectify that signal. Right? So doing such a sequence, I become specifically sensitive for dynamics at a particular frequency which depends on the time between these pulses, so the, the pulse spacing. So I can now do this and, and just take my electron spin and, and, and say, okay, I'm just going to measure kind of the spectral content of the environment. So here you see an example of, uh, of such data. So again, here we take the, uh, the electron spin, we prepare it in a superposition. And up here, it is protected. The coherence is, is maintained. And what we do is we sweep the time between these pulses. You apply 32 of these pulses and sweep the time. And what you see is indeed there's some sort of envelope of where we're protecting the coherence. That's what I've been showing you before. But now if you look in detail, you also see lots of other signals going on. So what's going on there? So this is really the electron sensing individual uh, nuclear spins in its environment uh, in, the, in the diamond. So we can zoom here uh, in here on the beginning and uh, look at this picture. What you see are some of these are very sharp spikes, very sharp dips in the signal. That's really the electron uh, sensing an individual nuclear spin. And there's also these broader features here, uh, which are essentially just signals that are overlapping from multiple nuclear spins in the environment. Now, somewhere in 2018, uh, we took this data and uh, we, we analyzed it ourselves by uh, looking at it and doing some, uh, some rudimentary fitting. And, and we showed that you can describe the signal really quite well by seven individual carbon spins, as well as a, as a bath uh, background, kind of classical background bath of many spins. I think that one thing that is, uh, is very interesting is that uh, recently, uh, in collaboration with the group of Do Hoon Kim, uh, Kim uh, we have um, uh, we have now applied machine learning methods to look at the same data or same type of data. And I believe this will be in, in the next talk. Uh, 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 you, you can see the details about this. But what we find there is essentially that whereas us looking at the data and trying to analyze it, we came up with about seven uh, spins. Good machine learning methods can extract much more information out of, uh, out of this kind of data. Yeah, for that, I want to... Uh, recommend next talk. Okay, um, so I've been talking about sensing. Our goal is not generally not only to sense these spins, but also to control them. How does that work? So now we have to get away from this kind of classical picture of we're just sensing some, some oscillating signal. Instead, now we have to ask ourselves the question, what is actually happening uh, to these spins in the environment while we're flipping uh, this electron spin around? 
And what the key idea there is that this nuclear spin evolution then depends on the electron state. So once we're flipping the electron around, these nuclear spins are going to undergo also some complex evolution. And in particular, if the electron state in it, in its, uh, is in its zero state, it's like it's not there, and all the nuclear spins will just precess, rotate around the z axis, the vertical axis. And now, if we uh, if, uh, apply such a sequence of pulses where we flip the electron, and say we flip the electron to, its, uh, to another state, let's say it's minus one state, it now creates a little magnetic field that these nuclear spins feel, and they now rotate all under a slightly different axis, and we have a slightly different uh, rotation speed. And now maybe you can imagine if you have some object that uh, is rotating, a vector that's rotating uh, in three-dimensional space, and you can switch between two rotation axes that are not parallel or anti-parallel to each other. Then you can rotate it anywhere uh, in 3D space. So that means by flipping around this electron spin in a smart way, we're not just sensing the nuclear spins, we're also controlling them. And because all these nuclear spins feel a slightly different field from this electron, because there are different distances and angles uh, spatially from the electron spin, um, they, you can all control them selectively. They all have a different condition of where you can control them precisely. In cartoon form, if we take the electron spin and flip it around with the right frequency, we can not only sense this individual spin, but also control it. If we then flip it around with a different frequency, then we can target and sense and control only this uh, spin in the environment. Now, this is essentially what we use to, to use this, this spins as, as quantum bits. And I don't want to go into too much detail there for the rest. Um, you can do then do experiments or, or little algorithms uh, that show that you can control uh, multiple of these nuclear spins. So here is an example uh, from some uh, recent work from our group where uh, kind of the most basic types of experiments where we take now one of these nuclear spins, first initialize it by swapping the quantum state of the electron spin to the nuclear spin. Then doing this uh, controlled gate to create an entangled state and then to measure uh, the result and show that we indeed created an entangled or a bell state between these, uh, these two spins. That works quite well. Um, one way that you can uh, make this quantitative is by giving a two qubit a gate fidelity. In this case, it's about 99%. But it's quite high quality control over these kind of systems uh, already. And you can then show that you can control many of these nuclear spins. And uh, in, in this paper, we showed that we could create a fully connected 10 qubit quantum register, where in this data graph here, you see the fidelity for all the 45 bell states, pairwise bell states that you can make with 10 qubit to show that they can all be entangled with each other and all connected uh, to, to each other. I just want to show that also to set a little bit the state of the art in, in, uh, in how many of these qubits can we can control and, and with what kind of fidelities. Um, because I think that the next section will make clear that, that if we can understand more of the environment, we can control both more qubits and also improve the, uh, the fidelities that we can reach by understanding the system better. Okay, so now we're going to ask the question, um, can we still detect and sense much more of that environment? And can we also image spatially these kind of complex spin structures? So we're going to look again at uh, using the NV center uh, to image clusters of these carbon-13 nuclear spins in the environment. And the motivation here, you can really say it's, it's twofold. Right? So first, we're using this here as a model system to learn how to image complex spin structures with the hope of in the future applying this to spin structures that are also outside of the diamond. For example, individual molecules or proteins or other interesting samples. There's a lot of work around the world uh, doing fantastic experiments, trying to get defects close to the surface so that you can also detect, um, uh, detect systems that are outside of the diamond. Uh, but here we take an approach. Let's take the spins inside of the diamond. It's a little bit easier. And uh, use that as a model system to learn and develop methods to image spin structures. 
The second motivation you can think here is that if we can detect more of these pins in the environment, this can either give us more qubits that we can control, but it also gives us a better understanding of the spins in the environment that are actually causing the noise for the actual qubits. And that then can be used, uh, hopefully, to, to, uh, to improve gate fidelity further. Right? So just understand better what the noise in the system actually comes from, which also comes from spins in the spins in the environment. Okay, so we have a quantum sensor, our model system of a cluster of carbon-13 nuclear spins. And I want to take first one step back and, and think about the state of the art at the time that we're starting this experiment. People already did some fantastic experiments, uh, for example, in the group of Christian Degen, who gave a talk uh, on Monday, being able to localize in space and image a few of these individual spins. Yeah, they've been also uh, working on that further, and I believe that they are now also uh, imaging rather complex structures. Um, and I think if the talk was recorded, you can look back at the talk on Monday to learn more about it. And the outstanding challenge here uh, really was that um, if you're not just looking at just a few spins, but you're looking at some sort of complex system, uh, this will give you it will all coupled together and it will give you a large complex system that gives you complex spectra. Now to really be able to image that, there's kind of two challenges. One is that you require enough spectral resolution to be able to see what is going on. And second, that from this complex spectra, you have to somehow extract a three-dimensional structure. And here we really want to be able to, uh, to image things on an atomic scale. So we want to be able to do this with sub angstrom uh, kind of position. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And uh, our approach is to not just look at the interaction of our sensor with the, the target spins, the nuclear spins, but actually to measure the interactions between the nuclear spins. And those interactions really reveal the composition and the interconnectivity between the spins. And that encodes the information of uh, their three-dimensional structure. Okay. So let's start with the, the simplest kind of sensing experiment that we can do. There's some free evolution or Ramsey experiment. So don't worry too much about, uh, about the details of this sequence. What we're doing here is just we're first using the electron spin sensor to create some polarization of these nuclear spins so that they are polarized in, uh, um, in, a, in a superposition state. Then we'll just let them evolve for some time. So they're just waiting. And then we detect what happens to this polarization. We're using some different sequences for that. That's a little bit uh, complex. Uh, some sequences where we're just doing uh, dynamical decoupling pulses. So we just invert the system periodically, but also some sequences where we then interleave this with, with RF driving. And the reason for this is that this allows us to detect spins in all directions from the NV center. Okay, so if you do such an experiment and you, you target one of these nuclear spins in the environment, you prepare it in a superposition, let it evolve and then detect what happens. Uh, you see a signal like this. So you see some complex beating an oscillating pattern and, and that decays over time due to decoherence. Now, what does this indicate? It indicates that this spin is coupling to its environment in some, some complex way. We can Fourier transform this and then and, and obtain a spectrum uh, for, for this spin. Again, a complex thing. And essentially, uh, as far as at least uh, uh, us humans uh, are not able, uh, as far as I'm aware, to make any sense out of this. And the reason for that is really that this is a very complex, unresolvable spectrum, where it, which consists, in our case, about 50 million spectrum lines. And uh, they're all broadened due to the, due to the defacing of the nuclear spin to a spectral resolution of about 30 hertz or so. OK, so if we want to make sense of this, we, we require a higher spectral resolution. And the way we can do this is by enhancing the coherence. So I, I showed you before, we can apply these dynamical decoupling sequences invert the spins periodically to enhance their coherence. So that's what we're doing now. We're applying a radio frequency pulse that uh, inverts the, um, uh, this nuclear spin. And then we can extend its coherence from just a few milliseconds to, to, 10, uh, to order 10 seconds in this case. And that really allows you to get a very 
in principle, high spectral resolution, because now you have a long time for the system to interact with the environment. Problem now, of course, is we have turned off the interaction with the environment. So we're not learning anything about how this spin interacts with the other spins. And the solution for that is to do something called double resonance. It's our uh, well-known ideas from, uh, from nuclear magnetic resonance. Where now we're applying a second pulse at a different frequency that's going to flip another spin in the, uh, in the, in the cluster. So we're now flipping these two together, which means that they're decoupled from all spins in the environment, but not from each other. And now we can get both a very long coherence time, a long evolution, and we keep this, this interaction. We essentially isolate this one interaction with very high spectral resolution. And you can see here, for example, uh, for this spin over here, it has this frequency if the other spin is up, and this frequency if the other spin is down. And you can see that even interactions that are only in the order of about half a hertz or so are very well resolvable. And the spectral resolution is very high in the order of about 80 millihertz. So this now allows us to, uh, to detect interactions in the environment with, with high spectral resolution. And uh, that's what we're going to use. Okay. Now, how do we get the full data set that encodes all this, this information? Now we just start sweeping all parameters. So one thing that we can do is we can sweep the frequency of this second pulse that is in this axis. And every time there will be a little peak, that means that, that frequency, there is a spin in the environment that is interacting with this other spin, spin number one. And we can sweep the time. What that does is it will just um, uh, allow the spins to interact. So what happens is function of time tells us something about the interaction strengths between the spins. Okay. We can also sweep this first frequency and that creates a three-dimensional data set. And that three-dimensional data set now really encodes and the composition, how many spins are there, and their connectivity uh, in, in this cluster. We then analyze that data to, to, to find the spatial structure. And the key idea there is that uh, this system is over is highly overdetermined. Right? So for m, m spins, we have about 3m spatial coordinates. Yeah? That's x, y, z for all of them but the number of coupling scales quadratically, right? So it goes with M squared. And that means once, once you have enough spins involved, the system becomes heavily overdetermined and, and you can in principle solve it. Now we actually do this in, in two different ways. Um, first, uh, by discretizing space where these spins live uh, according to the diamond letters, right? So we take into account this a priori knowledge that they must be positioned on the diamond letters. That is computationally uh, very nice um, and, and much faster. But second, we also use a very fine kind of cubic discretization of space, uh, much smaller than the lattice constant of diamond, which is in principle a completely arbitrary gen, uh, method to then reconstruct the three-dimensional structure of these, uh, of these spins. Okay. And um, what comes out of this is that uh, our signals contain 27 spins. And these are the 171, uh, oh, sorry, uh, and, and that we measure 171 couplings uh, between them. And here you see the, uh, the, the couplings that uh, between all the spins, the kind of matrix form. So this tells you at which frequency there are spins and with which other spins do they couple with what strength. And we then use that to reconstruct the three-dimensional image of the system, which you show here. All right, so it's pretty small. So it lives in about, say, um, three by three by three nanometers. And uh, we find the positions of all these spins and these blue lines are the strongest couplings between them. These are couplings stronger than three hertz. It's kind of the connectivity of the cluster. You can uh, apply fitting uh, fitting routines to this uh, to also get some idea of, of how sharp the, the minima is that we that we have found uh, and extract uh, uncertainties out of that. And you can see that the uncertainties on the spatial coordinates, so in this case, 77 spatial coordinates for 27 spins are all well below the diamond bond length. So we really have this kind of like angstrom or sub angstrom resolution here uh, on the atomic scale. 
Now, to give you some idea, what does this uh, uh, system in the end look like? Here's a three-dimensional view of it. Uh, it's actually a video. Let me see if I can start that. Yes. So the white balls that you see here are carbon-12 atoms. They make up the diamond. They're very boring. They just keep the diamond together. Whereas the yellow ones are the carbon-13 atoms that we that we have uh, been, been detecting and, and imaging. Uh, so there's 27 of them in, in here. And here in the middle, you see the, the nitrogen atom of the NV center and the vacancy missing atom. And this is the about uh, a few thousand of, of atoms that we that we images in images in this system in this way. Yeah, the hand down here gives away that it is not a computer simulation, but uh, one of these plastic chemistry models that the students have been building. Um, I think also that took a long time as well. Not as long as the measurements, but also a significant effort. And here you can see the, uh, the structure that was imaged. Okay, so why are we, why are we excited about this? Um, well, so first, this is kind of a first step or demonstration of how to use individual electron spins to image complex spin structures. Um, and ultimately, uh, how that, uh, we hope this leads to being able to image complex spin structures outside of the diamond as well, um, like molecules or, or proteins or other relevant systems. Now, second, by being able to, 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 to detect and uh, image and also control these kind of systems, and uh, we hope to get to the, to the point where we can, can, can use such large complex spin systems for, uh, to study many body physics and, and, and perform quantum simulations. And finally, these spins can act as our quantum bits, the quantum networks for computation and, and for, for cryptography, where some of these spins would be, uh, would be your, your, uh, your qubits, and some of these other spins might just be background noise, but now you also very precisely understand that. Finally, I want to say something about, okay, how does this connect from, to machine learning for quantum? I think the general idea here is that, so these are very complex systems, many spins that you're trying to sense and control. But on the other hand, the system is also quite simple. It's entirely described just essentially by dipolar interactions uh, between the spins and everything is extremely coherent. So you can get uh, all sorts of signals out. I think that allows it, uh, makes it a good test bed for uh, machine learning ideas, as well as a place to actually apply them. And I just want to quickly run to some some uh, some things where I think machine learning algorithms can play a very important role in this uh, in this field. So first, if you want to sense and image even more complex and larger structures, uh, it's going to be very time consuming the way we do it now. And the way we do it now is essentially very uh, precisely isolate everything one by one so that us humans can understand nicely what's going on. We get a, get a whole bunch of sine curves that we can then fit with nice, uh, yeah, nice cosines, uh, and in this way figure the problem out. There must be ways uh, to do this much uh, faster and, and, and smarter by thinking about what are the optimal um, kind of measurement sequences or, or smarter measurement sequences, how to sweep parameters smarter, and then uh, analyze the data uh, in a smarter way. That's for sensing. It's kind of the flip side of that is also for device calibration. If you want to use these devices as your quantum processors, uh, one uh, challenge that you face is that, uh, that while they're excellent, they're all unique. Each one of them is absolutely unique because these nuclear spins are positioned in, in random locations. That is not a problem per se, but one does require an automatic and efficient characterization, right? So ultimately, you would like a computer to automatically figure out this picture that we have here without any, uh, any human involvement. Especially if we want to build large quantum networks, where maybe we have to do this hundreds or thousands or, or perhaps even millions of times. And finally, once you have information about the, the, the environment, um, uh, can you design control sequences that control some of these qubits extremely precisely for quantum computation ideas? taking into account their interactions to all of the environment and, and, uh, and thinking about how can I get precise control while canceling the interactions that I don't want. Right now we're doing this with 
periodic uh, uh, inversion pulses. This is just uh, easy to understand, but uh, I also assume that that is not optimal or even uh, near optimal. So those are some things that you would like to optimize, and, and I think machine learning methods can uh, play a very uh, powerful role there. OK? Um, and one example we'll see, I think, in what's the next talk, where for this kind of sensing problem, uh, we have already made some progress there. With that, uh, I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm open for questions. I'm not sure if we're doing them right now or later, but I'm sure the chairman knows. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Tim, for the yeah fantastic uh, work you've shown us. So my camera doesn't work, but it doesn't matter. <clears throat> so yeah, <clears throat> there's some a few minutes now to answer questions. There's five of them already in the Q&A chat, so I'll, uh, I'll uh, Ask them. So Raul is asking, what are the parameters that limit the range of spatial distance to control nuclear spins and their spectral resolution? Um, yes. So what are the parameters that limit the range of spatial distance? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, do I interpret this correctly? That means what, what is limiting uh, how far you can control spins and, and their spectral resolution? So, so the, the spectral resolution is just limited by the coherence of your uh, sample or your target spins, so the nuclear spins. Right? The longer they can evolve, the more uh, sensitive they, they will be for, uh, to pick up a, a certain phase over time. So there, the, our limits are just essentially how much of these, op these pi pulses we apply. Um, and, and for simplicity, and also because these pulses are not perfect, uh, we limit it to typically just one to one or so, and that, that uh, uh, yeah, gives you uh, spectral resolution that we've been using. And the kind of spatial distance, um, ultimately, it's all about the interaction of the electron spin and the nuclear spins. The farther away the nuclear spin, the weaker this interaction. That per se is not so much of a problem in these experiments because the um, coherences are extremely long, so you could even detect nuclear spins that are extremely far away. However, as we just have a 1% concentration of nuclear spins, farther away you go, the more dense it gets. So what the challenge that you run into is one of spectral crowding. Would like so, a gradient, a magnetic gradient help in that case? Um, yes, that, that is a good uh, good suggestion. Uh, a magnetic field gradient uh, could help there. Uh, it is quite challenging to do that on this scale because here, yeah, the typical distance is a, is a couple of lattice sites, right? And you would want to have a significant gradient over that. This is challenging, but uh, that is one way to, to do it. We're now relying on the magnetic field gradient that the electron spin makes. Um, and this is uh, strong close to the electron spin, but then farther away it becomes uh, insufficient to spectrally resolve the spins in easy yeah. ways, yeah. Even if you're overrunning time a couple of minutes, I'll still ask a couple of questions. So Timo is asking, okay. could you comment on the role of back action and could you improve sensitivity by using weak measurements? Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so here we, this is actually a very complex question and I'm not sure if the answers are, are fully known, um, but I'll, I'll try to give some background. Um, so, so here we're, we're measuring these spins that we're detecting fairly strongly. And, and we, can, we can, in some cases, really uh, almost nearly ideally measure them. Uh, and in some cases, just uh, fairly strongly. Um, and what we're doing is we're, we're preparing them to some measurements, then we're letting them evolve, and then we're measuring them again. And in that sense, back action plays not, no role. Uh, other than, than you could say that the way we prepare the spins is by measuring them and projecting them into a, a, a given state. And that's of course a form of back action. But then the free evolution, we're not doing anything. So there's no back action. Alternatively, you could look at, uh, at weak measurement uh, sequences. So instead of applying a single measurement that gives you quite a lot of information, applying a sequence of um, measurements that don't perturb your system very well, uh, very much. And uh, yeah, I, I do believe that that can also be a powerful method. Um, I, I, I would say that's probably still an open question. When exactly what is better to do? Yeah, I think that's, yeah. A, I think that's the smartest answer right now without getting a long discussion. <laughs> and let me maybe just one 
quick last question that should be relatively easy to, to answer. So Remy is asking, how long can you, do you think you can store information on a single carbon 13? Is there any limit? Where is the limit? What is that limit? Um, yeah, well, what's the limit? Uh, I think it's hard to say. Uh, I, I, I would say in principle, it, I don't really see any, any, any limits. Um, in our case, we've, we've done this up to uh, uh, or 10 seconds or so. Um, and, and, and the limits come into practical things like applying all these pulses and potentially hitting your sample, uh, making errors in the pulses. Um, but for example, by isotopically purifying, by removing many carbon spins, I, I, I think you can go to much longer times. It does become extremely tedious to mention on a single spin, right? Because every time you have to wait, let's say you have a minute coherence, you have to wait one minute and then you get a, one bit of information, right? A zero or one, that's it. Now you have to repeat this many, many times to, to get an expectation value. So probably the limit will be practical data acquisition time, ultimately. Maybe a, a very, very last question. And then <laughs> it's just a very interesting talk. So I think we should discuss it. So Daniel is asking, how do you deal with symmetries in the dipole interaction, giving rise to the same interaction for different positions of the nuclear spin relative to the epicenter? I guess that's a very important point for this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, there's, there's also, there are a lot to say, but one thing that's very important to realize here is that that we get our information and the spatial structure in, in this case, uh, assuming we're talking about the imaging. Um, and we get it from the interaction between the nuclear spins. So even if there are two nuclear spins that have a very similar hyperfine interaction, and, and we also show with this in the in, in the publication that uh, about of this work. Even if they have a very similar hyperfine interaction and therefore a very similar frequency, so they're not resolved in, in, in their own frequency space, they will have a different environment and they will couple different to all the other nuclear spins. And, and because the system is so highly overdetermined, uh, that, uh, that resolves itself. So we, re so we really find the location of all the spins without any um, uh, sy symmetries left, except for translation or rotation of the entire system. Thank you very much. So thanks team again for the for the talk and then we can move on to the next one, which as was widely advertised is very related to this and we we'll introduce a way to analyze this data using machine learning by Kyung, Kyung Jung Jung, apologies for my pronunciation. So Thank this you. The next talk is recorded. So let's give the tech guys a few moments to, to set that up. And the speaker is, of course, available at the end of the talk for to answer questions. So, as always, please type them on the Q and A box. Hi, thanks for giving us to share our research. Uh, this presentation covers the our recent paper, deep learning in individual nuclear spin detection, and this is a, this is about uh, detecting nuclear spins with using the data from the hyperfine interactions with using deep learning models. Let me start with the experimental configurations. So what we use is MV center in a diamond sample for detailed structure here. There is an electron spin in, in MV center and surrounding nuclear spins of certain carbons. What we are interested in is certain carbons because of remaining nuclear spins. And if there is an interaction between these two spins, then a state of electron goes change. So if we measure the state of electron, we can obtain some signals like this, which is called CPM signal. This is what we use. And this signal have some information for hyperfine interactions. So by analyzing this signal, we can find out the hyperfine interaction stresses between these spins. So then, and then if we, if we obtain accurate hyperfine interaction coefficients, then it's possible to use certain carbons as qubits. So this research focuses on using uh, deep learning models to find out hyperfine interactions using CPM signals. Here are some key points for analyzing CPM signals. 
and this is the simple diagram showing the interactions. There is an electron and around the nuclear spins. If there is no interaction between electron and nuclear spins, there is no change in a state of electron, so the signal doesn't show any dips as time goes. But if there are two nuclear spins of certain carbons in the environment, then we can obtain signals with two different periods, where each period corresponds to each different nuclear spin. So in this case, period 1 corresponds to certain carbon number 1, and period 2 corresponds to certain carbon number 2. So if there are three different nuclear spins, then the signal have three different periods, and three different pairs of hyperfine coefficients. And there are some additional features uh, such as amplitudes and oscillatory fringe patterns near dips. So to obtain accurate hyperfine coefficients, uh, one needs to encode the characteristics not only period but also amplitude and oscillatory fringe patterns. But in practice, there are some difficulties to analyze experimental recipient signals, mainly because there are some overlapped signals from different nuclear spins with different periods. So it's difficult to distinguish each period by manual way. And on the other hand, the recipient signal becomes very complicated in theoretical perspective because this part in this equation is for a single nuclear spin, but as the number of nuclear spins increases, the number of multiplication also increases. So that means if there are 10 nuclear spins in the environment, then this part is multiplied 10 times. This is quite lengthy, and this makes it hard to figure out the characteristics of its dip in computational way. In other words, one can easily simulate CPM signals uh, by using the equations if the spin configuration is given uh, in a diamond, regardless of how many spins they want to simulate. But it's very difficult to obtain uh, high profile co coefficients from the experiment data because of this complexity in the signal. So uh, what we try to use is the supervised learning. Uh, here is the simple schematic for the supervised learning way. And as well known, uh, the supervised learning is done with manually preparing input and corresponding output labels. In this case, each animal image has its own labels, um, such as a cat image having the word cat as a label. And in the between, uh, input and output data, there are some neural net models. And we train the neural net to predict its corresponding labels when we when taking the input images. In our case, if hyperfine coefficients are given, then general recipient signals is quite easy. This is why we use supervised learning. And input data is similar recipient signals, and output data is corresponding hyperfine coefficients, which are used to generate this input data. So this whole picture describes our main scheme. So the trained model is supposed to take recipient data and predict corresponding hyperfine coefficients of the input signal. But there are some challenging parts when designing the deep learning models in a supervised way. For example, if one finds out two pairs of different hyperfine coefficients in the experiment data, and that means in a supervised way, some of the input trained data should be included using these, these values, and corresponding label output data have four numeric values A1, B1, and A2, B2. But when we design the neural net layers in models, we need to determine the dimension of the last layer, uh, which means uh, we need to know the number of hyperfine coefficients to generate input data. And that means we need to know how many spins exist in CPM signal in advance. But we don't know how many spins exist in advance uh, in the experiment data. 
and we don't know also the number of independent variables to generate CPM signals. Uh, so it's difficult to fix the dimension of the last layer. So this is the uh, main difficulty to design the neural net models to classify and obtain hyperfine parameters from the CPM signal. So what we did is to reorganize CPMG signals with respect to specific periods. In this case, we cut CPMG signal and stack all the segments to make 2D array. Mm. For example, in, um, there are three different grid spins, uh, and this is similar to CPMG signal. And, if, and we slice CPMG signal with a period of number two, and stack the segments and make 2D array. The target period here, uh, annotated as TPK, means a period which is used to slice the spin signal. In this image, the orange line um, is related to the signal of number two, and it's vertical here because the CPM signal is sliced with a period of spin number two. That means uh, even if we handle the same spin signal, uh, we can obtain very different images with respect to the target periods. In this way, uh, we can build the training data with a specific target period so that we can uh, build neural net models to classify each specific target period. This slide um, covers our procedures in our study. And step number one, uh, generate and reorganize CPMG signals. So step number one, uh, prepare data sets with respect to um, its corresponding target periods. And step number two, denoising part uh, to reduce the noise in the experimental CPMG signal. We used autoencoder structure to build denoise model. And step number three, classification for the existence of specific periods. So uh, we used uh, the classification model um, with logistic regression. And number four is obtaining coefficients. So this is the regression model and um, to estimate hyperfine coefficients from the predicted result uh, in the step number three. So we finally obtain hyperfine coefficients from the experimental signal. Uh, this slide covers the noise model. Um, the noise model have um, autoencoder structure. We actually build uh, the encoder using the 1D convolution layers and also batch normalization layers. And for the decoder, have 1D convolution transpose layers and one batch normalization layer. And all the channels uh, of the convolution layers is 64. And we actually prepare the input and output data with using the same equation before. And, but uh, the input data consists of some noise with Gaussian distribution. And so, for, so the model is trained to generate the output data from the noise input data. So if you see the result, uh, this is the uh, uh, experimental data before the noise process. And this is the, uh, the same data after the noise process. And if you see the confidence score, the maximum uh, number of dimension is the uh, different uh, before image is second, second one and after image is first one, which means the denoise model uh, corrects the some inaccurate predictions of the classification model. This is why we introduced denoise model before classification model. So this is the classification model, and uh, this model determines the existence of a specific period. So we prepare input data sets and output data sets like um, uh, various classes. And input data have no target period, like single target period, and two spins of target period. And that means no target period means uh, there is no images which have a vertical line signal. And their uh, single spin of target period means uh, there is always a, a single spin with a target period, so which have shown a vertical line here. And the two spins of target period means 
um, one target spin and the other one is uh, have very very similar but different period so we assigned uh, each image as a different one of letter and uh, this is the uh, model structure here and we actually use uh, simple dense layers and also between them uh, batch normalization layers with liquid yellow and this model um, outputs uh, the existence of target period in the image so after we process this model we can get uh, period information in the experimental reception signals so this is the regression model here uh, this model estimates AB values from uh, classified periods so we need classified period before using regression model uh, and in this example we have three different target period and in principle theoretically there are infinite number of AB values in each target period so our job is to obtain the best AB values to be well matched with the experimental data so we generate input data when using the same equation before with these values and the output labels the is the is the values of hyperfine coefficients of the input data so the model is the trained to estimate AB values uh, from the input image and the model consists of uh, pretty much the same as the one of the classification model so the dense layers and batch layers plus liquid yellow the thing is the uh, the last layer the dimension of the last layer is two times the number of vertical spin because one target period have two numeric values so after this model we obtain um, the predicted hyperfine coefficients from the classified periods and this is the result um, uh, the, the above one is the comparison of experiment data with the similar recipient signal and experiment data is the blue dotted graph and the other or colored solid line is the similar one and you can see almost all the divs are very well matched with the experimental data and the second one is the comparison of the previous results on the same MB center so the results of our research is the uh, above one and the previous results at the bottom and you can see most of the values are well matched and also we uh, detected the additional carbon nuclear spins in the CPM signal and the thing is you can see uh, this image uh, are very complicated but you can see also the line in the target data target period uh, so the deep learning model is well uh, trained to detect this spin in this image So for the conclusion, um, in this study, the number of hyperfine parameters uh, and those values can be obtained um, by fully automatic analysis through deep learning models. And the deep learning models can be um, effective for reducing noises in time series data. And in this case, we use the CPM signal. And for the future work is, um, the, is to uh, distinguish other nuclear species in the diamond and also localization by adopting nuclear nuclear interactions in the data generated model. Thank you for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions in this presentation. Good, thank you very much uh, for the talk. Are there any questions? I don't see any in the Q&A chat yet, so I'll maybe start by asking one. Uh, so you, you were speaking about the noising and you, you said that the noise was, um, you were looking at Gaussian noise. So I was a bit curious because I would imagine that the main noise source is the like Poissonian statistic. Can you maybe just comment uh, on the noise? Uh, we actually uh, tried to adopt some other kinds of noise models, but we actually find out that Gaussian model somehow uh, works very well to our CPM measurement data. But um, we tried to figure out why Gaussian noise really works well. But yeah, we, we don't really still uh, can configure uh, figure out that. Um, okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay. 
Is your question in the Q&A? Let me see. Ah, this is that is my question. Any other question? Okay, then I think we can stop this session here. Um, so just a technical announcement. Uh, looks like this Slack link we've given out has expired. So if people haven't uh, signed up, signed up for the, um, the Slack channel and they would like to, they should uh, try a different link, which I'll now post here in the in the chat. I hope you guys can see it, and we'll also send an email later uh, around. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Now we just have a break for 20 minutes or so. We are back at 1.30 UK time. See you all later.